So please, Patrick, uh, I would like to give the floor to you to give the welcome to everyone and we can start the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Danilo. And good morning and good afternoon or even good evening. And welcome to today's uh, workshop on innovative financing models for private sector investment in nature-based solutions for adaptation. Um, my name is Patrick uh, Ferkoyen. I'm the CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation. We are an international organization hosted by uh, the Netherlands government. Uh, why is it important for us to have this session today? Why have we organized this? Uh, let me suggest three reasons. One, uh, the COVID pandemic is showing us that we have a choice in how we respond to global threats. Two, these choices, we believe, will continue also to be important once COVID subsides. Uh, here in the Netherlands, we are still in a, in a crisis uh, mode as of yesterday again, but we also realize that other threats such as uh, the climate emergency have not gone away during the pandemic. And three, a global economic slowdown is now threatening to collide with the existing climate crisis. So as a backdrop of today's sessions, these challenges show us the urgent need to how to reshape to protect our environment and communities. So, um, because actual investment in green technology and resilient infrastructure can help put our pandemic shadow world back together. Manish Bhatna is with us today as well, uh, together with the WRI, uh, the Global Commission on Adaptation, which was launched two years ago. We have indicated that it makes economic sense to build greater resilience against climate change now, in the same way that we must strengthen our healthcare systems before the next pathogen strikes. We know, of course, that the COVID crisis has transformed the economic landscape, posing both threats and opportunities for the climate resilience finance agenda, including for MBS. We believe that the imperative to invest in the immediate health crisis and economic responses may put at risk a focus on long-term climate resilience, including MBS, or if well targeted, the vast sums of uh, fiscal stimulus may offer an opportunity to boost flows towards a climate resilient uh, recovery. We believe a massive scaled up investment is needed in nature-based solutions. It's not only good for nature or the services they provide, but it's also important because these investments in nature are highly cost effective. That is the starting point for today's discussions. It's time to move from small scale projects to larger interventions involving the private sector in order to scale up nature-based solutions. This brings me to why we're here today. We believe this is an action forcing event, which we are delighted to organize with Canada, uh, the GEF, the World Resources Institute, as part of the work of the Global Commission on Adaptation. As some of you know, there are different action tracks within the Global Commission. One of them is on nature-based solutions, and that action track is led by Canada and Mexico, and it aims to do three things. Raising the understanding of the value of nature, embedding MBS in planning policies and operations, and three, catalyzing investments. So this specific webinar will focus on the third pillar of the action track, on innovative financing models for private investment. Why? Because we believe that today's workshop should contribute to addressing the barriers and next steps in scaling up private sector investment in MBS and profiling innovative financing models. These models will be discussed and presented during today's uh, gathering. And we are honored to have the participation of many distinguished speakers and panelists, as well as the participation of all attendees joining us today. We just heard there are over 100 of you already joining and, um, and many more are joining as, as, as I'm seeing. With the presentation and discussions today, our goal is not only to profile current efforts, but I think more importantly, what we try to do is to build a roadmap of actions, what can be done in the decade of action, which will be launched during the Climate Adaptation Summit on January 25 in the Netherlands. This Climate Adaptation Summit is hosted by the Netherlands uh, Prime Minister. It's uh, completely virtual, and it will be really important to see how the results of today can be brought to the summit and from that through COP26 into the coming decade uh, indeed. Um, before we go into the detailed presentations of different models, I'd first like to introduce Minister Jonathan Wilkinson. 
he is of course the Minister of Environment of Canada. He is not um, uh, with us here today, but he shared a video. Let us have a look at that video. Hello everyone, thank you for joining today's discussion. It is my pleasure to be joining you from Vancouver, British Columbia, located on the traditional and ancestral territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam peoples. Both climate change and COVID-19 are testing the resilience of populations and economies around the world. The COVID-19 crisis has shone a light on the need to build resiliency, including to another simultaneous crisis, climate change. Canada is very pleased to be an active participant in the Global Commission on Adaptation and to support our shared goal of creating a worldwide movement to accelerate climate change adaptation. We are especially pleased to be leading the Commission's Nature-Based Solutions Action Track with Mexico, given the critical role that nature can play in building climate resilience. Whether through restored wetlands that reduce flooding in our communities, coastal ecosystems such as mangroves or salt marshes that offer significant protection against storm surges, or urban canopies that cool our cities, we know that nature can be our strongest climate ally. Governments have an important role to play in enabling nature-based solutions. In Canada, our commitment to protect a quarter of our country's lands and a quarter of our oceans by 2025 will have important mitigation and adaptation benefits. Indigenous peoples are playing an important role in this effort, including through Indigenous protected and conserved areas. The government recently announced protection for an area in the Seal River in Manitoba, one of the world's largest remaining ecologically intact watersheds. However, protection alone is not enough. We must also enable greater private sector investment in nature-based solutions to climate change. And that is, of course, what we're here to discuss in today's workshop. While it is easy to see that nature creates enormous value for resilience by reducing the costs of climate impacts, it is harder to make this an attractive proposition for private sector investment. We are seeing strong interest, particularly from the insurance sector, and this is very encouraging. Private sector finance will need to have a critical role in playing to develop solutions and protecting ecosystems at the scale needed to realize the full potential of nature-based solutions. Work has only just begun. Early examples of private sector financing can be powerful. Models that are presented today and the discussion of these models will, I am sure, constitute an important contribution to accelerating additional investment in nature-based solutions. I want to thank our Action Track partners, the Global Center on Adaptation, the Global Environmental Facility, and the World Resources Institute for organizing this workshop, and in particular, for running the competition of ideas that resulted in today's promising examples. I look forward to hearing the results of this discussion and to profiling the results in the Nature-Based Solutions Action Track as at the uh, Climate Adaptation Summer early next year, summit early next year. Merci, thank you. Well, well thank you so much, uh, Minister Wilkinson, for his uh, sort of extraordinary leadership on this particular topic. Three messages for me stand out. One, let's think about the mitigation adaptation nexus when we talk about uh, nature-based solutions. Two, we need a worldwide movement on adaptation, and obviously Canada and other partners are already driving this. And three, we need an attractive proposition for the private sector to really invest and take this up, this uh, agenda on NBS. So what better person to discuss, um, to follow up on this, uh, than um, Emma Howard Boyd. Emma Howard Boyd, like um, Minister Wilkinson, is a commissioner of the Global Commission on Adaptation. She's also the chair of the UK Environment Agency, has a lot of experience in from the private sector, the world of finance. Um, um, Emma, what are your views on this? Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you for that kind introduction. Adaptation is not an alternative to reducing emissions, but failure to adapt will result in an unconscionable human and economic toll. The impacts of disease and climate change do not recognise the distinction between the public and private sectors, and everyone needs to be part of the solution. But it's not just about avoiding risks. Adaptation can lead to healthier development and long-term returns for investors. It will also save lives, protect nature, reduce inequalities and create opportunities to build a safer, more resilient future. 
We are all here today because we want to unlock and catalyze investments in nature-based solutions. So I thought it would be useful to talk about where it is working. And it's an honor to speak following Minister Wilkinson. There's some great examples from Canada. Canada's $2 billion Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund is helping communities better manage risks from floods, wildfires and droughts through investment in natural and constructed infrastructure. $25 million of this is restoring salt marshes and improving dikes along the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. The project will reduce coastal flooding for tens of thousands of people, businesses, world heritage sites, indigenous communities, and more than 20,000 hectares of farmland. In the Netherlands, your country, instead of building ever higher levees, uh, you've adopted a room for the river net strategy to live with the water instead of fighting it. The country's moved from dikes inland, widened rivers, raised bridges, dug flood channels and added river catchment areas. This has helped create new parks, public infrastructure and recreational spaces. Now the River Rhine can safely carry a thousand cubic meters of water per second more than before. In Niger, farmers have led reforestation efforts by boosting crop yields, improving soil fertility, and lifting communities out of poverty. Tree cover has soared tenfold, and the daily time spent gathering firewood, a task that mainly falls to women, has dropped from three hours to 30 minutes. Mexico has identified and designated water reserves in more than one third of its river basins, covering nearly 50 million hectares. These reserves are a mix of protected areas and wetlands that help maintain adequate downstream flows and protect the water supply for 45 million people. Here in the UK, the Environment Agency is helping green projects attract private sector investment to tackle climate change and restore nature. In Greater Manchester, we are part of a project that aims to increase the city's green infrastructure by 10% by 2038. The Ignition Programme is looking to create at least 10 million euros worth of projects that incentivize organizations to invest in nature-based solutions. In the summer, along with DEFRA, our Department of Environment, the Esme Fairbairn Foundation and Triodos Bank UK, we launched four projects which will attract private sector investment, deliver sustainable financial returns and restore wetlands in Devon, create natural flood management in Lancashire, reduce nitrate pollution in Poole Harbour and restore peatlands in the Pennines. By demonstrating both effectiveness and economic opportunity, I hope these small projects will inspire investors to scale up such work. Such work around the world. The Global Commission on Adaptation says that compared to traditional infrastructure, nature-based solutions deliver more to implement and more sustainable in the long run. And they can also limit the spread of zoonotic diseases. Put another way, last year, the GCA released a report that investing $1.9 trillion in adaptation globally from 2020 to 2030 could guarantee $7 trillion in net benefits. These benefits come in the form of a triple dividend. They avoid future losses, generate positive economic gains through innovation and deliver social and environmental benefits. Through its Nature-Based Solutions Action Track, the Commission is bringing attention to nature's largely untapped role in adaptation, addressing key barriers and bringing together the governments, the private sector and civil society. As we've already said, the results from the Action Track will be showcased at the Climate Adaptation Summit in January, hosted by the Dutch government, and I see this as a key stepping stone on the way to COP26. I hope the discussions today, we can lead to accelerating progress towards these vital goals. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Emma, for your extraordinary leadership on this agenda, both at home, showcasing a specific project, the economic opportunity, but also the sustainable financial return, as you just uh, called it. And I'm also showcasing and putting a light on those success stories across the globe, uh, whether it's in Niger or Mexico or the Netherlands or, or, or the Canada in, in, indeed. But the question is, how do we replicate and go to scale uh, across the globe with nature-based solutions uh, on adaptation? So for that uh, uh, to follow up on, I would like to invite Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, CEO and chairperson of uh, the Global Environment Facility. Uh, Carlos, you also recently joined as the member of the Global Commission on Adaptation. I thank you for that. Oh, um, thank you, Peter. Hey, uh, Patrick, um, thank, what are thank your you so much. Please. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for 
for the invitation. And as this is my first time that I join you all at the event of the Global Commission of Adaptation in my new capacities at the GF, let, let me first uh, convey my admiration for this commission and my sincere uh, gratitude uh, to commissioners uh, for their vision, wisdom, leadership in advancing in what is one of the most consequential issues of our generation of this uh, century, which is yeah, adapting to climate change. Also, I would like to uh, especially thank the governments of uh, Canada and Mexico, who are the co-chairings uh, of um, <clears throat> the GCA action track on, on nature-based uh, solutions. Uh, as, as, as you said, um, <clears throat> I come from a country that has been able to really understand that it is um, <clears throat> cl that climate change is uh, not a, a domain solely of uh, the public uh, or um, philanthropic sectors, because uh, that, that can be naive and even dangerous. And, and to me personally, it doesn't make any sense uh, to think that way. In Costa Rica, <clears throat> we, we had, when, when I was 10 years old, Costa Rica has uh, the highest uh, rate of deforestation per capita of the planet. Uh, we totally lost our forest. By, by when I was around 40 years old, we come to realize that uh, based on good governance, key and well-focused policies, we were able not just uh, to revert the rate of deforestation, but most importantly, restore more, almost 30% uh, of the landscape. And that restoration was not the product of, you know, public expenditures or philanthropic uh, efforts, which were key in the process. But it was the understanding of two elements that, that are key in, in the context of what we now today at the global level need to understand. One was, you know, phasing out all of those uh, negative incentives, par particularly from the agrar agrarian reform, land tenure, public credit, and, and going from negative incentives uh, into positive uh, ones uh, and, and in terms of uh, forest conservation. <clears throat> so Costa Rica was able to uh, understand that uh, we need to create the enabling condition for the private sector to do two things. One is, dealing with their environmental footprint and the other one was creating the positive incentives to make um, good businesses uh, environmentally sound and in 1997 we came up with this very interesting idea of putting a tax on carbon it was the first developing nation to put a carbon on um, a tax on carbon the carbon tax is a northern concept and we all really understand but what costa rica did and then you know, uh, Colombia came along, a few other developing countries are, are designing their own uh, carbon taxes. It's what I call the, the tropical carbon tax. Uh, the idea is deal to, uh, with a market failure. You know, you, you own a forest or you have a area highly degraded, you need to restore it. Um, and in the process of restoration or conserving those areas, you provide environmental services particularly carbon offsetting, carbon sequestration, water production, biodiversity conservation, the market is unable to price and reward you for those positive externalities. When we understood that, we put a tax on, 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 on fossil fuels 1997 that began uh, to be used through a forest fund to do direct payments to people to keep their forests and restore uh, their, their land. That, um, that was a very interesting mechanism, innovative, because on one side, we forced the private sector to recognize that their negative externality carbon emission will be reflected in the price of, of, of fuels. And second, we began uh, leveling the economic playing field by which uh, companies and private sectors uh, understand that, you know, restoring watersheds, um, doing best practices in the agricultural sector will be, you know, very interesting in giving them more resilient to, to climate change, but also an economic opportunity of doing better in their own jobs. These uh, carbon tax have brought a later a, a payment for environmental services on water. And now we got a lot of companies investing in restoring watersheds because it's in their own self-interest to have a healthier watersheds. And they use the, the payment for environmental services mechanism that is in place uh, uh, because it's trusted, it's reliable, and can give them um, a very positive outcome. So the PS on carbon through the carbon tax plus the water PS payment for environmental services has been an excellent, very interesting 
financial non-fiscal uh, tool that Costa Rica has been used, bringing on board the private sector by upsetting and paying, <clears throat> but also um, relying on a system where they can put resources because they trust the mechanism, they trust the outcomes. This is why we see a lot of uh, water companies, coffee companies, banana companies, out of their own pockets and budget, putting resources in this PS program to invest in uh, watershed restoration, because it does make a lot of sense to, uh, to, for them to invest in their water towers. So that, that mechanism has worked uh, very well. When, when, when we do the assessment on how Costa Rica has been able to restore almost a million hectares out of a country that has uh, 5 million hectares compared to the rest of the region from Mexico to Colombia, every time that there's an extreme weather event, it can be a drought, it can be a hurricane, it, it can be strong rains and flood. Costa Rica is the one who stands better those extreme weather events uh, in any way you, you see it in terms of uh, lives and damages to infrastructure, but most importantly <clears throat> in the economic impact of that. When I see, and I've done this exercise in Central America after a huge uh, weather, extreme weather event, I see, I, I go in and look for the uh, financial assignment or repairment uh, by ministers of finance and Costa Rica is always the one that has the lowest cost in dealing with um, the impacts of, um, of uh, extreme weather events. So I, I, I tend to believe that you know, public policy can, can should and must send positive uh, signs uh, to the private sector to invest in nature more, more wisely. And, and governments uh, also have a strong role to promote, um, you know, the, 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 the process to, to phase out uh, perverse incentives and go from uh, negative incentives into positive ones in terms of land, land use and, and restoration and, and conservation. So I see three different motivations for the private sector to in invest in, in climate adaptation. I will go very quickly through them. One is, uh, yeah, is to make uh, their own business and supply chain uh, resilient to impacts of climate change. That's a very evident one. The second is to provide climate adaptation goods and services to others. And the third is to invest in and make a thriving business from climate adaptation and resilience of others. Those two uh, three elements are key. However, I tend to believe that there are uh, a limiting power from the private sector to invest in nature-based solutions for climate adaptation, especially in developing uh, countries. Uh, uh, some of those key barriers, you know, we went through them in a sense in Costa Rica. We have worked uh, with them uh, in the Latin America. You know, the first and probably the biggest one is we need to proactively create uh, incentive uh, frameworks uh, for the private sector to act. Uh, you know, the private sector really understands the private sector is even leading strongly than governments, but still it's not a big uh, good business to them to heavily invest in climate adaptation because the economic playing field has to, hasn't been, you know, arranged uh, by government and uh, through the enhancement and, and improvement of those uh, incentives and, and legal frameworks. We also need a more adaptation-oriented business uh, to be commercially ready and able to attract it, uh, investments. Um, we need to strengthen uh, the disclosure and management of uh, physical climate risk uh, by, by the finance and particularly insurance uh, sectors. Uh, we need to um, systematically get ease with the use of cli climate data information in the hands of private sectors in the end, decision makers are at all the levels. So we need uh, practical models uh, that, uh, that can come, overcome these and other barriers to invest in nature and climate adaptation solutions. I'm, I'm very excited uh, to hear uh, from, from the innovative financing models that uh, will be presented uh, in this event today. This is why the, the GF is continuing uh, investing in identifying, testing, scaling up of innovative adaptation financial models uh, in developing countries uh, together with the, the leading uh, a companies from the private sector's uh, partners. Thank you all, have a good day.
No, thank you so much, Carlos, for your very comprehensive uh, um, uh, vision which you shared with us uh, today. And let us also not forget that uh, the, the progress in uh, in Costa Rica in and of itself is largely due to uh, to you as a long-term minister of environment um, in uh, Costa Rica. Uh, I think the importance of highlighting innovative models, the role of public policy, the, the linkages with the private sector, uh, designing a positive incentive, I think that these are all really valuable um, lessons for us all throughout this uh, workshop. I think what you tried also, what you uh, indicated, uh, Carlos, looking at models which work, try to replicate and bring them to scale at speed. I think that's very important in and of itself. That's why I'm delighted to uh, to turn to Patricia, Patricia Fuller, um, the, the Climate Ambassador of Canada, to take this conversation forward. What are the current proposals on the table? How can we bring them to scale? And what can be brought to the Climate Adaptation Summit and COP26 to really showcase success? Patricia? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending upon where you are, to, to, uh, to all of you. And thank you for joining. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for me to lead, together with, with Mexico, the Nature-Based Solutions Action Track for the Global Commission on Adaptation. And we're having a, a series of events this fall. We, we had an Indigenous Peoples Dialogue last week. And now today, a very important event to dig into this discussion of, of uh, how to accelerate private sector investment in nature-based solutions that contribute to climate resilience. So we've got a great audience here, I see of 137 people at the moment. So let's find out who you are. We're going to, to do a, a little poll here. Uh, we'll ask you to identify what sector you represent. Uh, so you can choose the uh, private sector, multilateral development banks and international organizations, government, academia, think tank, nonprofit, NGO, or other. <laughs> uh, and while those uh, results are being uh, tabulated, um, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the process for how we got to today. And that was one where uh, um, we said as a group working on this in the steering group of the Nature-Based Solutions Action Track, you know, let's, let's really challenge uh, uh, the people who are working on, on innovative financing models to come to us with models that, that are really focused on the value of nature for resilience. And uh, what we got, uh, we got quite a few proposals. Uh, quite a few of them were fo focused more on, on the carbon sequestration value. Uh, and that uh, is not surprising because I think there's been a lot of interest in carbon offsets and, and uh, uh, there, there are markets for carbon offsets. So that, that's kind of a more well-developed space. But our question was really, how can you uh, take that, that value that we know exists uh, of, of nature for resiliency and make that an investable uh, proposition. So uh, we had a, a number of, uh, um, of uh, submissions, which we will make available on the website uh, following this uh, workshop. Uh, uh, but today we're going to hear from the, the five that we selected. But before we do that, we'll just uh, take a look at the results of the poll. Thank you, Danila. So we, we seem to have a very uh, 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 well-distributed uh, group here with us today, so that's great. Now we're just going to do one more poll before we start with our presenters. We'd like to ask you uh, um, what you think is the most significant barrier to investing in nature-based solutions for climate resilience. Uh, so you've got a list there. Is it the lack of financial incentive to invest in NBS? Or is it the lack of suitable financing models? lack of data or tools to understand the benefits of NBS? Is it regulatory barriers? Lack of awareness of the range of options? Or is it technical barriers? So uh, we'll ask you to, to vote on that. And uh, uh, just while we do that, a few housekeeping things. Uh, we, uh, um, we certainly want to have a good discussion with our, our great audience, our very diverse audience. So we will ask you uh, to put your questions in the Q&A uh, um, in the Zoom, you'll see the Q&A. So you please use Q&A, not, not chat. 
uh, and uh, uh, my colleague Michael Mullen will be uh, uh, reading those and helping me to moderate the discussion that will follow the presentations. Um, but but after uh, uh, the uh, presentations of these models, we have a uh, uh, a panel of two people who will be uh, um, uh, commenting on those, and I'll introduce them in a moment. But just before we do that, uh, let's go to the results of this of this poll. So lack of financial incentive. Well, that doesn't uh, surprise me. I think that's perhaps the, the biggest uh, issue in terms of the discussions we've had is just how to figure out how to make that uh, an investable proposition. Uh, as someone has commented to me, uh, nature-based solutions are, are tend to be public goods. How do you bring people together who have an interest in their benefits uh, and make it possible uh, for for those to be invested in. So, so our two panelists, I'll just um, uh, introduce them now. Uh, they'll come in after the presentations. We have Radha Kupali, who's the Managing Director of Investor Services at New Forests, a sustainable forestry investment management firm founded in 2005. And we have Mr. Jay Ko, who's a co-founder and managing director of Lightsmith Group, the first private equity firm to focus on investing in resilience to climate change. Uh, so we'll now, uh, oh, and I will mention before we start that uh, the, the event will be uh, recorded. Um, and I suggest in terms of your questions, you may want to wait until uh, you've heard a number of the presentations and, and consolidate your questions. And very important, when you put your questions that you identify uh, your name and uh, affiliation. So um, I'm pleased to introduce the first of uh, our presenters. Uh, the presenters will have five minutes. Uh, you will get uh, um, a one minute and 30 second warning in the chat, as well as at the 30 second mark, we'll display a, a, a slide asking you to conclude. Uh, so um, our first presenter, uh, oh, I, we've got the, the host is sharing the poll results again. Maybe Danilo, you can take those off the, the screen, thank you. So we have uh, uh, Mr. Urs Dietrich, who is the Land Use Fund Manager with South Pole Group. So uh, Urs, the floor is yours to present your model. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Urs Dietrich. I'm a Land Use Fund Manager at South Pole, and I will talk about the Landscape Resilience Fund. SDG2 calls for zero hunger by 2030. And, and yet tonight, um, you know, 690 million people will go hungry, which is 690 million too many. And climate change exacerbates the food insecurity that, that we have. And on top of that, coronavirus will force another 150 million people into extreme poverty by next year. So there is this glaring gap that we're all aware of between where most nature-based solutions projects stand today and where they start to become attractive to private capital. And we all know that we will not close the adaptation finance gap without significant private sector investment, as Carlos Manuel Rodriguez um, alluded to already earlier. And the Landscape Resilience Fund positions itself right in this gap by targeting the interface of corporate shared value, philanthropy, and impact investing. And we finance SMEs that have the potential to access capital markets once the Landscape Resilience Fund has invested in them. So what is it that we really do? We focus on SMEs with climate resilient practices in sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, and other nature-based solutions as a means to reach the most vulnerable, which are family farmers, women, indigenous people. And our fundamental thesis is that since you want to attract private return seeking capital for co-investment or for follow on investment to really come to scale, we use some of the same mechanisms, which for the beginning for us includes uh, soft loans, which then help SMEs build a track record. And this is, this is something you can see in the lower right corner of the graph. Our advantage here when providing soft loans to SMEs is we are a charitable foundation. This really frees us from the constraint of having uh, to return capital to our investors and therefore allows us to take risky positions. Uh, we can be courageous and try something new, which would, for example, include uh, taking junior positions in a capital stack and therefore really have additionality and uh, provide capital to others that otherwise wouldn't really uh, receive finance. 
And to corroborate our impact first objective, we found the need to have two additional funding windows, which you can see in the lower middle and the lower left in yellow and in green, um, which is a pre-investment support window to prepare projects for debt finance and a landscape window to account for wider impacts in the landscape and to reconcile competing natural resource demands. And through these three windows, we blend finance at fund level instead of a deal level, thereby allowing us to have a concerted approach and to be scalable. If we now move to the top of the graph, um, you'll see how we are funded. We have a target of 10% public and philanthropic capital. To date, uh, we have received uh, 1.3 million from the Global Environment Facility. And then corporations are actually our main funders with the current capital commitment of uh, 25 million US dollars by our anchor funder and another 25 to 50 million that we aim to raise uh, over the next few years. So why do corporates invest if there's no direct financial returns? There's really a understanding of responsibility we have seen among leading corporations and given the greenfield nature of adaptation finance, there's plenty of opportunity for corporates to differentiate themselves and to display exceptional leadership. And investing in the Landscape Resilience Fund provides an opportunity to improve brand recognition, and particularly in a time where customers um, increasingly align their purchasing behavior with their values. And, and there's also, of course, a supply chain element um, since we do invest in a lot of agricultural forestry projects that, that produce commodities that will then be off taken by um, other um, corporates. And then we obviously look for long-term relationships, uh, open and inclusive discussions, and we listen to what is important to them. So there's maybe three reflections I want to offer at, at the end, which is forward-thinking corporations can really be a catalyst for further private investment adap in adaptation, since they can set a precedent for return-seeking investors who are needed to really scale. We need to also really prioritize impact measurement and the development of adequate frameworks. Currently in adaptation, it's a lot trickier to understand what effective approaches are than compared to, let's say, um, mitigation. And then we also, we just need collective action to win this. Uh, with the LRF, the Landscape Resilience Fund, we look to collaborate, uh, we look to co-invest and engage in thought leadership. And we're always looking for good SMEs cooperatives and projects around the world, uh, especially in uh, least developed countries. So we're very much looking forward to hearing from you if anything like this resonates with you and then we'd, we'd love to have a conversation. And then we're uh, looking forward to uh, having a uh, thoughtful discussion and um, yeah, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Urs, that's great. <laughs> Now we'll, we'll turn to uh, Christoph Jungflisch, who is the founder and CEO of Yapu. Please go ahead, Christoph, with your presentation. Hi. Good morning, afternoon, and uh, evening to everybody. Thank you very much for inviting us here to present Yapu. Yapu is a software as a service and advisory system provider active in Africa and Latin America since 2017. Our approach is to focus on the creation of local capacities to promote um, and operate uh, data smart, climate smart, and nature smart production and finance. Especially under the cer uh, current uh, circumstances of the pandemic, we are truly committed to a um, paradigm change towards a resilient future. So who are we focusing on? We focus on promoting nature-based adaptation for the most vulnerable, um, the 500 million um, smallholder farming units and the 3 billion people depending directly on them. The segment usually has limited access to basic services and markets and is mostly excluded from formal financial systems. Um, usually it lacks um, awareness and capacity how to effectively adapt to climate change. The biggest barrier is hence a lack of understanding of climate and ecosystem threats but also um, a lack of understanding on how to access nature-based solutions to address these challenges. Um, such solutions always need to have a positive risk-adjusted return for them. So introducing nature-based adaptation stabilizes um, production and revenue for them, helps to increase food security for their communities, and um, spurs further development um, opportunities. 
So what are we doing? Um, we mainly work with private financial institutions um, and NBS providers. These institutions um, usually have an established infrastructure and personnel in place that can gather data on the reality of these smallholder farmers, but also disseminate um, know-how on how to adapt. They can channel private and public funding for the NBS investments of these smallholder farmers. Um, we have developed own taxonomies and MRV systems in order to verify and um, uh, supervise the success and implementation of N NBS. And where relevant, we adjust these taxonomies and MRV systems also to the local realities. Um, each identified um, nature-based solution is usually analyzed for its um, success drivers and economics. And personnel is then trained on how to identify, verify, but also promote uh, the most promising solutions locally. The investment itself is entirely borne and paid by the smallholder farmers. So the, um, the risk of the implementation is also lying um, almost entirely with them. In some occasions, we apply um, smoothing or, or risk transfer mechanisms too. Um, all these activities are recorded digitally, so um, we can work with big data in order to learn. Um, this data is um, data on location, on um, crop varieties, animal varieties, um, as well as production practices applied, including nature-based solutions. Um, captured data can then be matched against climate risk maps, um, so we can calculate what we call the gross climate risk based on exposure and sensitivity. We use um, algorithms um, to measure adaptive capacity and also to identify possible uh, nature-based solutions to respond to identified risks. The statistical analysis um, of resulting administrative records enables continuous learning um, to see what works and what does not work. So um, what are we focusing on? Our objective is to make nature-based solutions available to all. Um, there's an economic reason behind it. Um, and our target segment suffers from ecosystem deterioration, um, from biodiversity loss and climate change. We are establishing and, and um, we are involved in um, two major um, flagship projects um, with UN and IDB, um, Mehman Ecomitro, and have analyzed 23 institutions on the NBS capacity based on um, standardized scorecards we developed and are implementing first pilots um, with 18 institutions in Latin America and Sub-Sahara Africa. We expect finance demand for nature-based adaptation well beyond $100 million per year. Um, we recently started two further flagship projects and are now um, implementing with BNP Paribas a biodiversity finance platform and are working with Fundación um, Genesis Empresarial in Guatemala to focus on a deep dive in climate change, um, risk management and the financing of nature-based solutions. So what are we focusing um, uh, once we can overcome one of the main barriers, access to refinancing funds? Um, we are focusing on four um, lines uh, in order to spur NBS further expand our network of local partners, um, foster uh, know-how dissemination via a non-for-profit subsidiary, um, foster markets for NBS solutions um, via cooperation with incubators and accelerators, and um, uh, further provide data also to the final uh, recipients. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to um, engage in the lively discussions, uh, discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Christoph. And uh, now we'll turn to our, our third presenter before we turn to our two panelists to comment. Uh, so our third presenter is Gianella Vasquez, who is with Aquafondo. Please, Gianella, go ahead. Thank you. Well, good morning with everyone. My name is Gianella Vasquez. I'm from Aquafondo, and today I'm going to talk about the water pumps. So to start, I have to say that Aquafondo is the water fund for Lima and Callao. In total, we have 25 water funds in Latin America, and we are part of the Latin America lines of water funds. Water funds are financial, governance, and management mechanisms that integrate relevant stakeholders in the basin to promote water security in a metropolitan area through conservation actions. We provide scientific evidence that contributes to improve the knowledge about water security. 
we develop a shared and actionable vision on water security. We convene different actors that through collective action promote the political will necessary to achieve significant, positive and magnitude impacts. We promote and encourage the implementation of natural infrastructure projects or nature-based solutions and offer a platform to invest resources in a cost-efficient way in water sources. For almost 10 years, we have developed conservation actions in the three basins of the city of Lima, which present serious supply problems due to climate change, which has caused extreme droughts and floods that cause soil erosion and a reduction of the existing water supply. Currently in Lima, there is 125 cubic meters of water per person, below the World Health Organization figures, which indicate that populations that are below 1,700 cubic meters of water per person are in a state of water scarcity. Against this backdrop, Aquafondo and its partners, the Nature Conservancy, Hea Group, Peruvian Society for Environmental Law, Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, Bacos Foundation, Rotoplast, Pafco Wading, Nestle Peru, and Hydro Dio, with a seed capital of $1 million, develop a strategy to attract contributions from the private sector and international cooperation in an organized and transparent manner. We are a registered APCI entity, which means that we can receive international cooperation funds and we are also recipient of donations, which give us the right to issue a donation certificate, a document that can be used by companies to deduct their taxes according to the amount. On the other hand, we develop a strong process of awareness and create instruments that allow us to show the private sector the economic risk of a water crisis, which reveal that the water situation for Lima in the next 10 to 15 years will be unfavorable in a scenario of 30% decrease in the water availability and supply, the national GDP will be affected by 1%, considering that Lima generates approximately 50% of the national GDP and around 35,000 jobs will be lost, affecting approximately 120,000 inhabitants. We have invested more than $3 million in 22 demonstration projects, whose objective is, in addition to directly contributing more water to Lima, to lay the groundwork for the correct mobilization of public resources, to show hydrological monitoring data, and to unblock process for early investment. Our projects benefit more than 3 million people both in urban and rural areas, is retaining capacities, conserving 1,810 acres and generating approximately 2 million cubic meters of water, which considering the current rate value with an amount of 52 cents of dollar per cubic meter of water translates into more than $1 million per year. Returning to nature and including it as part of the solutions to be implemented to ensure sufficient quality water for various uses is often a cost-effective alternative. Our model effectively introduced the cost of water conservation into the marketplace, preserving ecosystem and promoting rural development and urban resilience. And consequently, Aquafondo seeks to continue contributing by promoting sustainable investment and ecosystem services, influencing public policy and supporting scientific research to find possible solutions to ensure the future and to actively contributing to the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals, mainly the goal six, water and sanitation, but also in a transversal way, contribute to the other 16 sustainable development goals understanding that we will not be able to reduce the poverty, the gender gap, achieve more sustainable cities or generate economic development without water. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gianella. So uh, we will now turn to our, our panelists to comment on uh, the models that they've heard. So uh, please, uh, we'll start with, uh, with Jay Ko. Please go ahead, Jay. Thank you, um, Ambassador. And great to be here. It's really an honor to be a part of the commission's discussion here um, and to see the action track on nature-based solutions. I think it's a fantastic set of examples of innovation here. Um, so Lightsmith really thinks we, we, we have a great opportunity out there in the private sector for investments in adaptation and climate resilience growth stage companies. But it's great to see the range of solutions that we've, um, we've had laid out here. I'll, I'll just go through quick comments on each of them because I think it's fascinating to see the range of uh, potential stakeholders that are engaged here in the models. On the Landscape Resilience Fund, I think it's fantastic that there's a real engagement here with multiple sets of stakeholders. The SME part of 
The missing middle problem in development has been classically understood. To engage them also with corporates and also with communities through the landscape window, I think is fantastic and also will play a really important role in how we recover from COVID <clears throat> by supporting the capacity in SMEs. I think it's fantastic that there's several stages of investment, uh, including TA preparatory activity moving into soft loans. That's a great glide path for companies to actually engage in. And the only things I would say is uh, encouragement would be to add, uh, consider adding to the uh, ASAP taxonomy, thinking about how to actually con consistently define what SMEs fit under your nature-based solutions adaptation strategy, um, and also to look at mapping there. Um, the last thing I'd say is that there's a connect the dots piece here beyond what this program does in Landscape Resilience Fund, there must be access to follow on investment from venture capital or growth. And I think that would be a great um, set of solutions. On Yapu, it's really wonderful to see a tech infrastructure piece be put really in place here. And I think the bi-directionality of information here and creating a solution to the knowledge gap and the data gap, uh, which is essential to actually taking real action is a, is a great innovation. Um, the scorecards also, I think if there's more con consolidation or harmonization of that and connection even to the EU sustainable finance taxonomy or other taxonomies would be a great way to make sure we don't end up having an Esperanto problem where people invent new languages no one wants to speak. Um, the other thing I would just suggest here is there's other data that can be run back and forth on the railway lines now that you created uh, through the APU um, uh, application. I would suggest you connect with ERS and see if you can connect with his SMEs uh, and broaden the landscape here. Um, I also think that one of the most important things is if you can translate the data and the metrics you're getting out of the efficacy of these nature-based solutions into credit impacts or actual uh, profit and loss implications for the smallholders, the take rate on that will be dramatic. It's a language problem and you have to translate it ultimately for the private sector in dollars and cents. On the Aqua Fund, this is actually where all the action is gonna happen, which is at the sub-national level. Um, as someone that sits on a New York State board where we're focused on uh, the energy transition, but also on resilience, I think it's critical to look at things as that kind of sub-national unit. I also think as one of the suggestions, It'd be great to take the Aquafunda model and copy paste it to every single major city around the world, right? To take this integrated approach to conservation efforts. Um, the two things I think are wonderful about it are that the tax deduction and the actual indication of what the cost of water is in the marketplace are the great financial signals that come out of this project. So it's not merely a stakeholder engagement process. It actually has a quantifiable outcome, which is what the private sector wants. The second thing that I would suggest really is that you have an amazing ability then out to compare both nature-based conservation um, measures and conventional conservation activity and to look at the efficacy between the two um, and how they can integrate and supplement each other. And so I would encourage you to, rec uh, to record and publish data around how those two sets of interventions actually work. But congratulations to all the innovators here. It's wonderful to see the range of investors and range of investment activities and interventions. And I think each of these actually contributes to, I think what Naoko Ishii and Carlos Manuel have called this sort of transformative or systemic approach uh, to, to, to adaptation, where you integrate nature, but also multiple stakeholders in an overall approach. And that's exactly what we need, particularly taking account of the fact that we're going to be moving out of a fragile COVID impacted environment. So thank you and congratulations to everyone. That's fantastic, Jay. Thank you. Uh, Rada, over to you for your comments. Yeah, thanks everyone. And thank you for um, uh, having me. So I come from an institutional uh, investment perspective and looking at how to uh, raise capital towards sustainable forestry investment. And so as Carlos um, said, Manuel Rodriguez said earlier, you know, we need to create economic incentives for all landholders. Um, and one of the challenges uh, that we have in particular is how do we get more institutional capital uh, into emerging markets, in particular into to land based um, land based solutions and nature based solutions. Um, I think the Yapu um, Digital Solutions is a really exciting uh, technology platform. You know, in our own business, um, we are thinking about how do we actually um, increase sustainable forestry, community forestry, agroforestry um, across smallholders um, in Southeast Asia and other regions where we operate. So I can really see um, an opportunity to bring this kind of technology and integrate, as Jay was referring to, um, profit and loss data, geospatial analytics, uh, climate um, uh, mitigation potential, uh, resilience factors, and to really use that data to think about how we actually scale up um, the amount of land that we can bring into nature-based solutions. So I could definitely see you know, applicability of this kind of technology, even in the things that uh, we're thinking of doing um, with institutional capital uh, around sustainable forestry. And I think there's a whole host of not just climate mitigation and resilience, but you know, a variety of payments for ecosystem services uh, and, uh, and payments for better land management. 
Um, the Landscape Resilience Fund also, I think, is a, a fantastic model. Again, if we are thinking about how are we going to get more institutional capital into emerging markets, we are ultimately going to need uh, blended finance models that bring uh, together corporate capital, concessional capital, uh, public capital, um, to create a track record um, and actually build up companies of scale um, uh, that um, we can ultimately drive uh, into you know, long-term uh, institutional equity. And so I echo also you know, Jay's thoughts around, um, I think the important thing with this Landscape Resilience Fund is to think about um, what is the track record that we want to create? You know, what are the kinds of companies that we want to bring into this uh, that create um, uh, high quality demonstration of what we can do, uh, you know, in, uh, in these different markets? And how do we ultimately, what's the end game uh, to bring, uh, you know, um, larger scale capital uh, into the market? Um, Aquafundo, really exciting because as Jay said, it is a replicable model. We can be doing this uh, all over the world. And I think that's what really excited me when I was reading, um, reading about this and listening to the presentation. And the thing that's really interesting to me, and I would love Swiss Re's reflections on this in the next panel is, um, how do we start to um, value and think about um, the actual reduction in risk uh, in these, um, if, if I'm an institutional investor, I'm thinking about investing in some of these regions and thinking about a climate constrained future, um, how do some of these, how does a model like Aquafundo actually reduce my risk uh, to actually go into um, that you know, geographic region um, and that city? And how does it actually start to change discount rates, risk profiles and underwriting? And I think that will be a really interesting place to get more data uh, to understand that. So again, congratulations to all of you, really, really interesting work um, and I can see it applicable to um, a lot of the business that and work that we're doing as well. Super, thanks Rada. Now we'll go to the the uh, last two models. Uh, we're going now to Philippe Brahin who is head of America's uh, Public Sector Solutions at the Swiss Re Group uh, to do his presentation. So Philippe, please go ahead. Thank you, Patricia. Good day to, to all of you, and, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present today to participate in the work of the uh, Global Commission. And uh, maybe I wanted to share with you a few words about Swiss Re before moving on to the two solutions we'd like to present to you today. If you, you go to the next slide, in a nutshell, you can see we're a global leading reinsurer. Uh, we offer insurance reinsurance solution around the world, around 150 countries for more than 150 years. Uh, we have a very deep commitment to sustainability at Swiss Re. It, it is impacting, I would say, environmental risk, societal risk, impacting our core business. And so from very early on, we've been engaged in this uh, debate, raising awareness around the industry and, and beyond. Uh, and we have here, you can see our mission, which is to make the world more resilient, which is very powerful, but very true. That's very much what we believe in, what we, we work day in, day out. So if you go to the next uh, slide, you can see the uh, two solutions we want to uh, highlight today. The first one is the uh, coral reef cover we developed in Mexico in 2017 to protect the coastal area of the state of uh, Quintana Roo around uh, the Bay of Cancun. Uh, the bay is exposed to hurricane, experienced frequent damages. It was true back in 2005 with the hurricane Vilma. And then early on, the local authority researchers realized that hotels and beaches that were actually protected by the coral reef uh, were less damaged. So with that, they conducted the research. They assessed the benefits of the coral in uh, reducing the power of wave surges and reducing the energy of storms and as a consequence, reducing damages on the land, uh, on the beach, on property, and people on the shore. And so with that background, we engage with Swiss Re and we partner with the scientists to fund the Nature Conservancy, the local Mexican government entities, local universities, as well as property owners, uh, to analyze the ecosystem and develop an insurance solution. The uh, solution we uh, developed was a parametric cover on the uh, based on wind speed index. And this, we apply this index uh, over a GPS defined geographic area, which was a polygon we defined with, uh, with, uh, with the client in, in Mexico. Now there are two interesting aspects in this uh, innovative solution. The first one is uh, the role of technology and the benefit of technology in developing the solution to measure the insurance trigger, again, which was wind speed and to assess the potential damage of the event. 
And the second interesting aspect was the creation of a new entity, the coastal zone management, to administer the solution, which means to collect collect tax fee uh, from tourism, to pay the insurance premium, to manage the fund, and make sure that uh, if the index is triggered, claims will be paid and allocated uh, uh, appropriately. So these were two interesting, I would say, uh, elements in this uh, public-private partnerships, innovative solutions. With, uh, with us. Now, the second example, maybe Patrick is, is aware of it, is a construction risk cover we uh, developed to provide in 2019 the restoration of a sand beach on an island in the Netherlands, the island of Texel. The island needed uh, renovation, the dike needed renovation, a lot of sand needed to be uh, moved and, 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 and marron grass had to be recreated and planted. And with that uh, solution, Swiss Re, we were able to uh, support the construction of this uh, nature-based solution and support the funding, ultimately, for the project to move ahead. Uh, we at Swiss Re team up with the local water management company, construction engineer uh, teams, local authorities to develop a comprehensive construction insurance solution and uh, ultimately to enable this nature-based solution. So in a way, it was a traditional insurance solution for an innovative uh, project. So the, the whole benefit is the restoration of the dike that protect the land from storm surge. It also uh, protect the biodiversity of the coast, the property uh, for the residents, and the tax income uh, came from visitors on the, on the island. And this project won multiple prices. We're very, very proud of it. So now, obviously, we are looking to replicate such solution in other parts of the world with other public and private, uh, you know, with public and private partners. And I want to mention Canada, where we are working closely with the Insurance Bureau of Canada, the IPC, as well as the Municipal Natural Assets Initiative, the MNAI, to raise awareness about the role of uh, insurance enabling nature-based solutions. And this is what uh, the, the, the minister, I was very pleased to hear the minister uh, Wilkinson mentioning it earlier as well as uh, you know, working with municipalities and looking for opportunities and solutions here. And I'd be happy to tell you more during the, the Q&A session about this work we have ongoing with Canada. So with, with that, I look forward for the Q&A. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present today. But back to you, Patricia. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, great. Now we will turn to uh, uh, Hervé Salignac, who's Director at Finance for Impact, to present the fifth model. Go ahead, Hervé. Thank you, Patricia, for the opportunity as well. Um, first, a few words on who we are. Um, uh, Aegis uh, is an infrastructure uh, project engineering firm, which is affiliated with French Caisse des Dépôts Group, a national public bank. Uh, it's involved in building and managing constructions in all sectors, but in particular on maritime activities with a focus on uh, solution around coastal management, uh, reforestation, flood management, uh, or riverbank uh, restoration. Finance for Impact is a social and environmental advisory firm. We advise public institutions and private groups on climate finance and impact valuation. Typically, we design uh, public policies and we help uh, transform these uh, policies into implementable projects with a positive impact. So why, why are we presenting this idea of a blue bond with an impact credit marketplace today? Well, the idea came about as we worked on a, on a project together and the project was about developing a technical solution and a funding compensation mechanism for dredging around multiple ports on the West African coastline. Uh, it's a project that actually combines greenfield port infrastructure with the need to manage coastal degradations resulting from dredging, which also affects uh, the local communities that live nearby. So we came up with a solution that can manage this situation from a technical, but also a financial uh, and, a governance, and a governance viewpoint. Um, let me just say in a few words what our beliefs are to, to, to both AGs and Finance for Impact and, and what brought us together on this. First, in respect of, of nature-based solutions, we see the great potential there is to adopt a holistic approach covering financial, environmental, and societal aspects, addressing on an equal foot uh, biodiversity and financial goals. We think that it is key uh, for projects to be designed with the negative externalities being priced at the source of a project and not uh, being faced at a later stage uh, as additional uh, unexpected or even ignored uh, project costs. 
So in fact, we think that nature-based solutions are definitely a, a way to boost the development of public-private partnerships. And in respect of finance, we see the financial community as a true instrument of change, provided that they are directed by their regulators. So moving from voluntary declarations, as we all know, to a more coercive approach uh, is a necessary trend. But equally, understanding and complying with the principles of finance is very important. Uh, so uh, those principles, as we know, relate to yield, risk return, and de-risking, or looking for repeat transactions, uh, diversification, uh, and scale. So what's our proposal? Well, our proposal is to, is to promote a well-known but not yet well-established financial instrument, which is the blue bond. Uh, what are blue bonds? Blue bonds are long-term publicly traded bonds to finance projects in sectors of the blue economy. So the bond would actually be issued by a public authority in our proposal, preferably credit enhanced through a multilateral bank. This would give it access to very cheap funding uh, from the debt capital markets. Uh, it would be a similar uh, instrument to the one that has been already experimented in 2018 uh, in the Seychelles or uh, as a Baltic blue bond by the Nordic Investment Bank. In itself, we think it's important to support blue bonds as a mainstream sustainable finance instrument because credit investors are typically attracted to repeat transaction profiles and to instruments that are actively traded uh, in scaled up markets. The uh, innovation uh, that we are proposing here lies in that the bond would be reimbursed in part through the budget of the public issuer and in part from proceeds of the sale of what we've called impact credits. Um, so in a way that the first benefit would be that it would contribute to minimizing the public debt service. But what do we mean by impact credits? Uh, the way we imagine it is that they would be itemized contributions to nature-based solutions projects. They would be structured as tokens with a value that would depend on project types and on the type of donors being targeted. The NBS projects would be selected based on their potential for ecological gains or benefits for local communities. And there would be an assessment of the environmental and social costs, direct ones, indirect ones, or opportunity costs uh, to put a value on the project work streams. So the proposal would be to sell these credits through a, di a digital, dedicated digital marketplace, uh, which in itself would be different from the carbon uh, credit platforms because it would actually point to specific project sites. The marketplace would target, in our, uh, in our view, both the promoters of greenfield projects that generate negative impacts and need to commit to mitigating actions and to uh, private or corporate donors in the voluntary market who would be able to choose the projects they wish to support. So in effect, the main idea is to avoid the complexities of biodiversity offsets and to create a simple net gain platform to attract uh, private money. So in, in, in summary, with this idea, what we really aim to suggest is the creation of an innovative solution that combines the benefits of helping to boost blue bonds as a mainstream financial instrument, attract private sector money through the marketplace, and promote the idea that NBS projects should be a standard in effect for the financial community, just like project finance is. And lastly, as a, as a, as a benefit, to provide a replicable model for local deployment globally. Thank you very much, and happy to answer any question that you may have on, on this idea. Great, thank you, Hervé. Now we'll go to our panelists. So we'll start this time with you, Rada, please, if you'd like to comment on the Swiss Re and Finance for Impact uh, models, please. Sure, I'll start with the um, Aegis ports. Um, so it's very interesting. And um, one of the things I would um, urge is that I think this, this idea of the impact credits is, um, is innovative. But certainly there is also experience um, from other sectors around um, wetland and mitig you know, mitigation banking in the US, uh, different efforts to do uh, biodiversity banking um, uh, in different parts of the world. So I think there are some um, good lessons learned uh, and experience that we can build on 
Um, we, in fact, uh, um, some years ago, um, experimented with a biobank uh, in Borneo linked to forest conservation restoration, linked to oil palm production. And I think one of the things that's quite interesting um, that um, this proposal has touched on is the digital marketplace. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, that wasn't there. And the thing that's quite exciting is to actually be able to link um, specific impact and, and in projects um, to companies and to consumers. Um, and we've, I've even seen, for example, um, you know, credit card companies that are thinking about um, having more sustainable uh, products that they can offer to customers. And they're actually looking for high impact projects that um, uh, their consumers, for example, can offset their impact or uh, invest in. So I think there are some really new and innovative um, models um, that are coming up that can um, use the digital marketplace. I guess the question in my mind is, um, there's still a, an element of philanthropy um, associated with the impact credits. So how do we actually think about creating you know, sustainable cash flows um, in the course of, of that model? Um, so I think that will be a, a key challenge, but um, definitely some interesting opportunities. Um, in the Swiss Tree um, uh, uh, case study, super interesting. And I guess the innovation here simply is that the capital in, is being focused on um, projects that are protecting and restoring nature rather than you know, continuing to fund projects that are destroying nature. Um, so one of the things I would really love to understand more in the discussion is how quickly can we accelerate capital deployment into you know, more of these projects, in particular when it comes to the insurance sector? You know, what is the um, prognosis for the insurance sector to keep um, pushing on um, projects that, uh, that um, emphasize resilience? And so I'm really interested to hear um, more uh, about that in our, um, in our discussion, because ultimately, again, coming from an institutional investor perspective, um, we have to look for ways to uh, reduce risk and create um, investment destinations that are going to be investable uh, in this uh, climate constrained future and higher risk environment um, that we're going to be investing in over the next you know, 10 to 20 years. Um, so I think that will be a really interesting place to have some discussion. Thanks, Patricia. Great. Thank you, Rada. Uh, over to you, Jay, for your comments on those two models, please. Great, thanks. And again, fascinating um, innovations. I think uh, in a way, it's great to see some more conventional approaches slightly updated and applied here. I mean, the innovation for innovation's sake is exciting sometimes, but the speed at which we actually need to, to address the climate problem means that if we have good tools that we can orient at this problem, um, we should do them immediately and scale them as fast as we possibly can. There's not a lot of farm to table um, time uh, for kind of uh, artisanal solutions to the effects of climate change. Um, so turning to that on the insurance side, I think the Swiss Re solution is fascinating for a number of reasons. We've been long very interested at Lightsmith in data and analytics companies that actually can do the modeling in a new environment that looks forward at the new set of conditions going forward as opposed to just looking at the 10 and 20 and 50 year history of the uh, risks and vulnerabilities that we're seeing out there. I think three things are really exciting about the Swiss Re approach. One is um, the parametric instrument here. So it's not just looking at damages with a long uh, assessment period after the fact to actually uh, generate benefits from insurance coverage, uh, but the parametric triggers mean that there's very quick responses, and I think that's been very effective in making sure that people have a lot of credibility in the instrument. And the second thing is, um, I think there's real recognition that it's not merely risk transfer. It's really great to see the integration, both the financial cover here, but also real physical interventions, right? Protective measures that are being taken as part of the project and integrated basis. So it's not just simply transferring risk from one part of the world to another. It's actually reducing that vulnerability and doing that in a way that integrates with the community. The third point here is this makes very clear as a framing device that nature-based solutions, like all investments that we make going forward now forever, need to also be resilient to the impacts of climate change. So by creating a framework here where the private sector can understand or the public sector can understand what risk is actually covered and not covered by the scope of the project itself, I think the application of insurance here, uh, particularly parametric, which is a quick, um, a quick clearance kind of uh, mechanism, really gives uh, a lot of comfort to folks that might be investing here. The two things I would suggest would be interesting to hear from Swiss Rebe. One, uh, will you begin to release the data um, as it dynamically is 
um, identified uh, from these types of projects. Year, year on year changes will occur in the climate going forward forever now. And so <clears throat> the risk to the, to the coastal reefs, the risks to mangrove stands, the risks to other sets of nature-based solutions are going to change and the pricing of that risk will need to change as well, potentially. And so that would be a really useful way of actually benchmarking how that change is occurring and, and being quantified financially. And the second point is duration. Uh, insurance is really exciting. The one in 100 standard, um, as people from Wells Towers Watson and uh, lots of folks at Swiss Re and other places, uh, is a great way of looking at risk. Uh, but most insurance policies and insurance cover only one year forward. Uh, and that's not going to actually cover long-term solutions that we need infrastructure and nature-based solutions projects. So understanding what the duration of cover here is um, when you have insurance to you don't have insurance is really a question, which we're seeing right now when the wildfire California situation might cancel all of insurance in California. On the <clears throat> blue bond strategy, very similar comments to Rod is I think it's really exciting to see this attempt to monetize or to create credits that can actually have monetary value in the blue bond um, universe. In addition to suggesting that there's other models that you can look at, um, I would suggest strongly trying to connect the dots here to the broader landscape. Um, one of the big structural problems in adaptation and climate resilience is that there's no financial, non-financial metric that we use to generate an understanding of what we make in terms of progress against adaptation or climate resilience. In mitigation, the common currency that's not financial is tons of carbon dioxide avoided. So you can save money by energy efficiency and reduce carbon, and you can spend money by investing in renewable energy and reduce carbon as well. In adaptation, all we count right now under the UNFCCC process is how much money we spent, which is a terrible way to make progress uh, or measure progress. And it's also not a great incentive to save money and generate outcomes. So I would suggest that in the context of these credits that you're generating off of blue bonds, thinking about how they connect to the broader adaptation landscape and whether or not this can serve as one component of how we think about quantifying what the baseline currently is in adaptation and what the target is for adaptation across multiple different parts of uh, the economy and society, including the uh, blue, blue, uh, blue ocean uh, area, uh, and thinking about whether those then can be actually measured and actually targeted so that you could trade adaptation credits the same way that you trade uh, carbon credits. The last point here I'd say is, you know, making sure that this ends up not just being a small currency among a very small number of players on the credit side, but a broader landscape and a broader market um, would, I think, increase the efficacy of this strategy uh, in its innovative way of moving forward. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the uh, positive and negative experiences in the carbon markets. Um, I think connecting the dots here on the adaptation side and creating a similar kind of broader approach um, beyond just the blue ocean piece of it, I think, would be um, a really interesting way of scaling up the impact here. But I think both sets of applications are excellent ways of taking existing models and applying them to a new environment. And I think create the kind of comfort that taking conventional instruments, tweaking them, orient them at the nature-based solutions area can really give to the private and public sector. So I think these are great examples of innovation as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jay. So uh, thank you for to all of the presenters and to the to our two panelists. Uh, we'll now go into a, a discussion uh, segment, and uh, I uh, uh, would just remind you that you can put your questions in the Q and A. I see a number have been uh, answered already, so if you're looking for more answers, maybe repose them. Um, and I'll also tell you that if you would like to, to, to speak your question, uh, you can in, indicate that in the Q&A that you would like to, uh, uh, to, to speak to pose a question to uh, uh, one of our, our proponents of the models or, or one of the panelists. Uh, but just to kick things off, I'd like, to, and this picks up on something that I've seen in the, in the Q&A, uh, I'd like to just ask uh, each of the, the proponents of the model to just clarify, are you relying on, on impact investors uh, at this stage or are, are your models offering a return uh, to, to investors? Uh, so Urs, starting with you for South Pole, I know you said you're, you're, you're in this first stage, you're uh, corporate investors would be coming in largely as impact investors. And I, I, I noted you said that that kind of sets the stage for, for investors uh, who would be return seeking investors to follow. What will drive the return in your model for those, uh, for those return seeking uh, investors? Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, you, you're right. At the current stage and with the current instrument, there will not be financial returns to the investors. So all the returns generated from the SME loans 
will revolve. This means they will be reinvested either in the same SMEs if they continue to make good progress and need capital or in other adaptation SMEs. We are, however, um, aware that in, in order to really scale, you also need to be able to disperse money to investors. In this case, the current model would be that we would uh, attract co-investments or then follow on investments. So refinancing of, of our activities. So then it, in the end, it's, it's, the, um, it's the call of these other investors, but what will drive their returns, just like what will drive the returns for our revolving mechanism is um, mostly uh, the you know, production of commodities. It, it can be, um, let's say shade grown coffee. It can be um, sustainable agroforestry, cocoa. It can be new technologies in cocoa processing that will um, increase the training of uh, cocoa farmers create, um, in, in, and uh, in, in, increase the, the prices, therefore. Um, so it's, it's mostly based on that. Um, there is the option to include ecosystem uh, payment finance as well. And that will be the case in some, in, in some uh, SMEs and in some landscapes but that's not the focus. So it's more really traditional financial mechanisms that we use to drive value. Right, good. And that's something we've observed that certainly in the agricultural space, the productivity benefits of nature-based solutions can, can be a driver for, for, for return and is perhaps a, a better established space than some of the, the other types of nature-based solutions. Uh, Christoph, for, for Yapu, would you, would you like to just perhaps crystallize how you see the returns being generated for investors? Well, I think um, on the, in the short term, it's definitely depending on impact investors, patient capital, if you want so, um, with lower um, expectations for returns. Um, what we try to show is that there's an economic uh, rationality to adaptation, a nature-based adaptation. Um, so there are concrete economic benefits. Um, remember, we are working with smallholder farmers. So expectations um, uh, are not only that there is a positive um, economic return, it needs to be in the short term. Yeah? So I cannot work with solutions which have in the first step um, more than 12 month, 24 month um, amortization periods if I don't have adjusted financing offers, um, uh, smoother um, financing um, for this. So um, in the short term, I think um, in order to push and prepare the market and also for financial institutions, banks, and cooperatives moving into these spaces, you need sort of a blended finance mechanisms that can push it forward. In the medium to long term, what we are expecting, it's um, really a question um, of um, financial returns. Nevertheless, focusing triple bottom line um, uh, results in the sense that we look for financial returns, social returns, and environmental returns. So it's a, it's a, it's a phasing in um, maybe to these markets. Great. Uh, Gianella, for Aquafondo, could, could you clarify, I understood that there were corporations that are investing in this, uh, in this fund. Uh, um, what is their incentive for investing in the, in the Aquafondo? Yes, thanks for the question. Well, for the private sector, when we implement a MBS, our objective is to measure through hydrological monitoring the water gain in economic terms that demonstrate the profitability of our projects to the companies and when they will be recovering their investments. We have this indicator for them. Uh, okay. All right, Philippe, for, uh, for Swiss 3, please. No, thank you. So, you know, as an insurance company, really the core for us is underwriting, right? So we look at how do you price, how do you cost the risk? And that's, that was the, the primary, uh, you know, I would say actions of, of Swiss Re in this whole uh, engagement on, on climate risk and, and so forth. Uh, and it started from the underwriting liability side of the, uh, of the balance sheet. It's, uh, you know, only in 2017 that we actually shifted the entire investment portfolio under ESG benchmark. And actually, today we see more investors coming to us to learn from our experience from an underwriting costing standpoint what we have done and how they can measure, you know, the, the, the physical risk impact of climate change on their investment portfolio. So they come to us to better assess their investment portfolio and investment profile based on the experience we have uh, built and developed over time on the liability side, on the pricing, costing side 
of uh, climate risk, environmental risk in, in general. So I, I would say no, no, no contribution, no, no, no input from their side yet. Right? Uh, we're more supporting them, helping them than the other way around. But hopefully, you know, with their efforts and all the efforts of regulators, also in getting the whole financial financial services industry up to the the challenge, we will be uh, learning more from impact investors. So that that's where we are right now in this uh, journey. Mm -hmm. It's a journey. <laughs> Philippe, um, can we turn to, to Hervé, please? Yeah. Uh, to your question about the proposed model, um, uh, does it actually require strictly impact investors or, or, or more conventional ones? I would say that in itself, the blue bond uh, which is already a well-known instrument, can attract conventional investors that want to uh, want to invest in a product that has an impact component to it, but generates a yield which satisfies their uh, requirements for for conventional yield. Um, and 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 what we've got here is an idea that uh, relies on the blue bond being reimbursed from two uh, streams of income. One. Uh, the uh, budgetary contributions from the issuer of the bond, and two, the proceeds that come from uh, the sale of impact credits uh, within the marketplace. So uh, that's the first dimension, which in my mind uh, represents a true blended product that would, that would attract private investors. And then you might say, well, then how can you secure the revenues coming from the marketplace, well, the best way to secure uh, revenues generated by the marketplace is to ensure that it is a wide and attractive proposition. Thus, the idea that the marketplace seeks to capture two types of uh, uh, private funds. Uh, the first one coming from project promoters who are uh, interested in, in compensating uh, their own projects with adaptation products, projects that they would select by buying credits that support the, these adaptation projects, projects, and two, private uh, or corporate donors that simply make donations to projects that they wish to support and communicate on. So it, it's a two-step uh, process that we have in mind here, which is intended to maximize the chance of attracting private investors. Okay, uh, good. So let's uh, go to questions then from participants. Uh, so um, M Michael Mullen of the Global Center uh, for Adaptation is going to help me with this. So uh, Michael, I know we have some questions that have been answered live uh, and others that are still open. Uh, would you like to, to throw out uh, uh, one of those at this time? Sure, happy to. Um... So something that's come up in different forms from a few questioners was this question about even if some of these ideas could ultimately become self-sustaining, they need some support at the initial stage, whether it be public or philanthropic, to get off the ground. So it'd be good to have the panelists' reflections on um, how can that support be provided most effectively to help generate and develop this um, pipeline of innovative proposals. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, the, the question then uh, is, is how can, uh, um, how can, what kind of support can be provided in this early stage that's most helpful from the public sector? So, uh, so perhaps we'll, we'll run through in the same order. Do you want, do you want to speak to that or, or please in a couple of, a uh, uh, couple minutes? Sure, thank you. Yes, it's a crucial question. And I think uh, time has shown that many of the most innovative large scale uh, proposals that we have and that dominate technology this time have been supported by government funding at early stages. And, and actually our um, fund, the Landscape Resilience Fund as well, has received some uh, EU funding by the European Institute of Technology. And uh, I think this is certainly crucial to have some of this accelerator incubator funding and, and they're popping up everywhere for certain different areas. So I would uh, encourage everyone to 
look for them. It's incredible um, how, how this is happening. Um, it, it would be good to have some more transparency in this market of different accelerators, but there is, is a good chance. And, and because, I mean, it does certainly take quite some, some money to set up these structures and more that, than, than one might initially um, think of. And then maybe there's a, another part of the question that would focus more on the, the type of support that would be needed on the ground where impact would actually be generated. Uh, this is where uh, there are certain technical assistance facilities that, that operate there. And I'd be happy to speak to that or take that question on, on privately as well when it comes to these types of extension services that have to be provided to get businesses investment ready. Okay. Uh, perhaps, actually, we don't need to have all, all the panelists co comment on this question as we do want to keep this moving. So who, who else would like to, to uh, speak to the question of what kind of public uh, uh, support you need in the early stage? F Philippe, did I see you on, on mute there? Yes, yes, happy to, uh, to contribute here, Patricia. So you know, I, I mentioned uh, the, the work we're doing with the uh, municipalities in Canada, and I think it's an interesting work we have ongoing where we're trying to assess uh, their awareness on the need for nature-based solutions, their interest to develop such solution, uh, their readiness. And then we see a little bit what are the challenges, what are the obstacles and what are they, they're raising. So we're still collecting uh, the answers. But interestingly, in the first uh, feedback we see, we see the main challenge being the access to budget and funding, right, definitely. And so that's where we need to early on when we're in such a project, really identify uh, where is the funding of a, a potential solution be, uh, be maybe coming from. And that may take time, right? And not only to identify, but then to set it aside and, and so forth. And when you think about insurance, you know, a lot of uh, stakeholders, unfortunately, they see insurance as a cost. They don't see the benefits until they're hit by an event, right? And so we have to do a lot of education on our side to explain the, the, the true benefits of insurance. But this you know, uh, budget and funding uh, obstacle is the, the concern number one. The number two is around uh, cost benefit right, of the project. And a little bit back to your question about uh, impact investors, return on investments, uh, we need to help them and assess them. And we have, uh, as we should develop a methodology to, to, uh, to assess this economic of climate adaptation and how we can uh, measure the benefits of a solution and, and assess the, the return. So that's also the part that we have to do on the private side when we engage uh, with uh, you know, uh, municipalities or public authorities on this, um, on this project. So, you know, these are a bit of our, our experience. It's, these are long-term projects. So you need a lot of stakeholders around the table and be, and be patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who else would like to comment on this question? of? Like yeah, maybe maybe yeah, Chris will speak. Yeah. No, I I think just um, from the public side, I think we need to look at two dimensions. One is the multilateral development aid or development cooperation, um, where we have existing institutions which can um, expand what they are doing. Um, I would rather also take into consideration the national level, um, where we are speaking about uh, ministries of environment, where we are um, speaking about public institutions at national level. And I think there it is where it is needed that we start uh, a closer cooperation, aligning what is possible in a country, that we share data, that we get access to data, um, but that we also, um, between municipalities, provinces, um, and national governments, coordinating directly with the private sector in order to be aligned. In the end, adaptation is a collaborative um, endeavor and effort, and it's a process. Um, so we will need to be working on that together, also at national level. Okay. Um, perhaps we could go to some of the the questions in the in the in the Q and A. Um, I, I am noticing that there's a couple of questions about the blue bonds, which would be for you, Hervé. Uh, uh, how does it differ from forest carbon biomass, biomass offsets? There's a question about blockchain there. I'm not sure we want to get into that. But, mm. uh, and then uh, are you using uh, uh, green bond principles? Uh, mm. And if not, are you linking to your, are you developing your own guidelines? So perhaps you could take those. Oh, yeah, that's a lot of <laughs> a lot of questions. But in terms of blue bonds, it's it's quite the fact that green bonds have now got ten years of history behind them. So they've managed to uh, convince the market of credit investors of issuers that there is a purpose, there is a benefit to be found in in issuing green bonds. And indeed, there are a number of standards that have now emerged. Uh, 
which uh, which uh, the most uh, well-known ones are the sustainable or green bond principles, but there will be more coming, particularly from the European Commission this year and, and, and into next year uh, with the European green bond standards that will make uh, the market, uh, let's say, uh, even more efficient when it comes to uh, to applying common uh, rules and principles. Blue bonds, in, in contrast, don't have that sort of... Uh, let's say, um, uh, framework established for themselves. And that is the reason probably why after a few transactions, there still is a, a very meager uh, pipeline of transactions in the marketplace. So there is definitely a need to uh, make sure that those uh, blue economy projects get directed to blue bonds and that some of the underwriting banks uh, are prepared to uh, uh, to, to make that recommendation to, to, to issuers. So definitely, uh, in my mind, uh, the need for blue bonds to be supported by public entities, by uh, issuers who are directing, directing uh, monies into uh, blue economy sectors. Uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, is who, who, will be, uh, who will be interested in, in, in doing that and, and, and why? And that is, the, that is the reason why I think blue bonds need to be supported by uh, ideas such as the one we are, we are proposing here, which is to tie it with, uh, with a biodiversity or an impact credit marketplace, if that helps. <laughs> Okay, great. And, and um, it, from our panelists, there's a couple of questions that I just thought we should go back to. Uh, Rada, you had one for Swiss Re that perhaps you could reiterate. And um, Jay, you had commented on the, the data challenge. And I wondered if, if our uh, proponents from Yahoo wanted to elaborate on that. But Rada, could you just uh, reiterate the question that you had for, for, for Swiss Re, please? Sure, I guess my question was around, you know, what is the trajectory for, I guess, the acceleration of um, insurance products, you know, into um, projects and, you know, green infrastructure, um, you know, into kind of more a resilience, um, resilience infrastructure? You know, how do you actually see that kind of, um, you know, unfolding uh, in the in the coming years? Thanks, thanks, Rada. Look, it's it's a huge uh, challenge for us. So we are very, very active at Swiss Re, and uh, you know, observing the debate, the need for infrastructure around the world, and how uh, long-term investors and insurers can can contribute. Right, and we part of our frustration is a little bit the uh, the demand supply is not meeting, and we're here to to help and support. Right. Uh, and so th there is there is a little bit there is a big effort on our side, and uh, somehow we're not making progress uh, quickly enough, right? So we have you know I would say two, two challenges. The first one on the on the underwriting side is making sure that we can de-risk uh, some of these projects at the right time, at the right place to enable such infrastructure investments, right? So uh, sometimes we, uh, you know, a sponsor of an infrastructure project is is stuck somewhere in executing the project. And actually we could be a solution. They don't think about us. We are not being made aware or the mechanism is not in place to to contribute from the, from the underwriting side in supporting the uh, execution of a project. And so we, we, we engage and involve with a lot of stakeholders at the investor side, at the sponsor side, to make sure we have the right touch point to, to enable this project. So there is a big, big incentive for us to do more. And you may have heard us in many panels on infrastructure projects uh, trying to help and, 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 and raising our hand to say, we definitely see the need, the gap, and we want to fill this gap and we want to be uh, your partner there. Number one. Number two is on the investment side. Investment side, uh, there are still you know regulatory uh, requirements that are not uh, supporting the uh, investments of uh, long-term investors like Swiss Re to uh, have exposure to, to infrastructure investment. So when you think about solvency requirements, capital charges on insurers, the regulators are still a little bit suspicious about the riskiness of this uh, project and may not enable long-term investors like us to actually take the exposure we would like. So we have an ongoing debate with our regulators to uh, help us build what we call infrastructure as a proper asset class for us to take uh, to take more risk. 
but we are heavily in engaged in this uh, in debate and do want to contribute uh, much more because you know as long term investors we have a lot of of investments on corporate or, or government bonds and we see infrastructure bonds as a very good effective way for us to diver diversify so we do would like to see uh, the ability to take more 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 exposure here and more investment uh, on the investment side Patricia could i ask one follow up question yes go ahead rana um, that's really helpful, Philippe. I think that's really interesting because, you know, when we started this conversation in the poll, it was sort of like, well, what are the financial incentives? But my, my mind was actually kind of going to kind of the regulatory side when we think about resilience, and that's kind of what you're saying. How do you think things like, you know, the TCFD, the Task Force for, um, you know, climate-related financial disclosures, how, how, can that, how can those kinds of mechanisms also push... Um, forward on resilience, you know, as companies and institutional investors start to disclose where their sort of physical risks are, um, can, if we combine that with data, can that start to, you know, push us forward in terms of um, uh, creating incentives to, to put more capital into, into green infrastructure and nature-based solutions? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm with you here. We, um, you know, we we're very happy to see the FSB engaging, right? They actually reached out to us to, to help them in the task force. So we're a member of the task force. We've seen the, the recent reports from the central banks, how they are also uh, promoting uh, greater disclosure from financial institutions. And we as a, as a sector can be a, a huge driver of this shift. Regulators and politicians and government officials see that, they, they, they appreciate that and they are, you know, using those that are most advanced to lead and, and those that are behind to, to catch up. So absolutely, these are, these are very good, uh, important, uh, you know, in, in initiatives which we are, mm -hmm. we are supporting in many aspects. And uh, uh, the banking regulators may be more advanced. Now the insurers are, are picking up uh, to, to, to make sure that the whole sector is, uh, is involved. And then you can see different parts of the world, different regions uh, more or less ready. But definitely, you know, we've been uh, applying the TCFD disclosure. We have it in our annual report. We're working with them on the next uh, level around, uh, you know, the whole um, strategic risk and scenarios. And we're working with the European Commission on Taxonomy on the task force uh, there also. So uh, these are important drivers of the, of the change. And we, we see a lot of positive momentum for, for things to come together. And the insurance industry has, has a great contribution right, to, to provide. So uh, hopefully that will unlock many of the uh, you know, potentials that we'd like to achieve. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, just under 10 minutes left. So I know there was uh, the question that Jay had raised about data. I do just want to check in before I go to you, Jay, whether, uh, Michael, do we have anyone who wants to pose a question live or any questions that haven't been uh, answered in the, in the Q&A? Um, so we've had no requests that I've seen for live interventions. In terms of questions with the q and I think one that might be interesting for discussion is this issue about inequality. Um, in particular, as we seek to monetize the benefits of um, ecosystem services, how do we do that in a way that avoids reinforcing existing inequalities? And that was a paraphrased question from um, let me just check the name, Jamie Webb. Okay, good. So who, who, who would like to comment on that? Uh, either our model proponents or uh, our panelists who would like to comment on that question? Trish, I'd be happy to kind of kick it off and then maybe relate the two questions together because I think it's a critical question, particularly um, in taking account of the COVID situation we're really in, right? So the vulnerabilities and fragility of a lot of the different systems have obviously been exposed. Um, and the kind of knock-on effects where you've had pollution impact, um, disadvantaged populations, um, women, other um, uh, sets of groups um, compounded now with the environmental impact of wildfire or flood or storm, all of which are being accelerated by the climate problem really has uh, demonstrated that uh, the most vulnerable populations are vulnerable to multiple vectors of risk. And so I think taking account of that um, in any intervention that we do in response and trying to come out of uh, this current environment, um, both socially, environmentally, economically, 
And in light of the fact that we're going to continue to see more volatility on the climate side is going to be a critical question. And how that's shaped with trillions of dollars of potential stimulus coming forward um, is going to be very, very important. And I think there needs to be really affirmative measures taken in the design of these strategies and projects um, that focus on disadvantaged populations, on women, on not reinforcing the inequities or not creating displacement um, that creates um, and exacerbates some of these problems. So we have, you know, in our work with the Jeff and the NDF, we do finance, we do um, gender inclusion strategies. Uh, we try to take account and measure in our own impact measurement and our investments, uh, differentiate impact on gender. But I think a real focus on this equity problem is very important. I think one question I would um, sort of turn this on into maybe any of the uh, proponents is on this question of metrics then, because each of you has a different set of approaches to measuring your progress or measuring the risk that you're engaged in. And, and I think, again, this is great to see this much uh, innovation across multiple stakeholders, but wouldn't it be nice if you were all measuring your progress on adaptation or climate resilience in the same way so that interventions in insurance could protect um, projects that nature-based solutions generate value from that could be measured in the same way that SMEs supported by the Landscape Resilience Fund could generate uh, products and services to support that or data and analytics that are supported by Yahoo can help engage in farmers in uh, then creating measurable benefits in that way or the blue bonds credits could be translated into ways where you could actually measure them the same way that you've got insurance interventions or the aqua fund um, interventions could look at the difference between nature-based solution efficacy and these kind of metrics the same way as conventional conservation efforts and so I mean the metrics question is a very old one um, but I would strongly urge folks to consider adopting a common currency. And I wonder if any of the um, existing uh, uh, folks here on the panel side or on the um, proponent side have thoughts about that, because I think that's one way of thinking about it. And then thinking about how that affects specifically vulnerable populations. And if we had a unit of metric uh, measurement to do this, then we could think about how that's generated and how we can incorporate um, disadvantaged populations into being part of that solution set. And a challenging question generally in the adaptation space around uh, how to measure it. So who would like to, to comment on that, either proponents or, or, uh, or even someone from the, the audience? Would Patricia, like I would like to give it a quick comment. Um, thank you, Jay, yes, for raising this important issue. And, and, and I think it, it is uh, undisputed that having such a metric or such a metric catalog and system would entice private investment. Um, on the other hand, I think we have to be very careful when it comes to this um, because it's just so local and context specific and um, especially when it comes to um, inequalities. And, and I think most of us who have, you know, when they have visited projects in their due diligence and have spent some time, it, it's very humbling sometimes to understand how much you don't understand. And that's really, it, it could just be exacerbated um, by the wrong approach. Um, however, I, I think there are some very promising ideas also, let's say, in the biodiversity space. For example, there's the STAR metric currently being piloted by IUCN. It's the species threat abatement risk metric. And that actually takes something that's very complex and context specific to a metric. And, and, and I would be very interested in having some type of working group around this. I've been reaching out to some organizations that are leading in the space and would like to offer this as well here. Um, to, to get together and see what could be, you know, sensible approaches that would be sensitive to issues like vulnerability and, uh, and inequality. Great suggestion. Or who would like, who else would like to comment on this question of metric? Yeah. I would like to. Yeah. Just um, um, <clears throat> so we are working with our clients and partners, um, which are mostly banks and cooperatives. Um, we are working on. Um, different models to um, measure adaptive capacity. And of course, we can do this with a gender focus too. Uh, so usually you see certain patterns um, according to these models we are working with um, for different economic activities, for different um, beneficiary segments. Um, and I think, um, yes, I would definitely welcome if we could get to industry standards. Um, I think there are several um, initiatives going in that direction. Um, we are working there um, and, and aligning two standards evolving. So I think um, it is important, but there are approaches to it um, which are already in the field and which cater to the specific situation, especially of the most vulnerable ones. Others who might like to comment on this question? 
maybe Patricia. So definitely agree with uh, what has been said and, and uh, echo the, the call of Jay in terms of uh, developing consistency in metrics and aligning metrics. We we know there are initiatives, like Christoph was mentioning uh, it, and uh, so there we are engaged and involved uh, at the international level when it comes to ESG disclosure reporting in general. Uh, we mentioned the TCFD, that's one, but there are many others that need to align. And we know that there are initiatives in bringing them together, which are very, very critical. When you talk to investors, they want to be able to compare, right? Their cost of opportunity clearly needs to be uh, shifting in one direction or the other. And if the people are reporting in different ways, this is extremely confusing, it doesn't help. So we need cons consistent uh, disclosure. And there is a big, big work on the way again. Different regions of the part of the world having different views, but uh, it's uh, it's needed. Uh, and you know, we when we face investors, they're asking for it, and uh, we need to, uh, to to respond there. On the on, on biodiversity uh, and uh, you know index or ecosystem index, I just wanted to mention some work that we have done at, at Swiss Re recently. We put out a paper where we develop a, a biodiversity and ecosystem index. Uh, we, we, we look at uh, different ways of integrating uh, data to develop uh, biodiversity uh, categories. And um, Jay was asking earlier about uh, what Swiss is doing when it comes to sharing data. So Jay, that's a good source <laughs> for you to go into, uh, look at the work we just published and uh, please follow up with us with the uh, questions, but exactly what we're trying to do to, to, to measure, to quantify and to uh, share with our clients and the public sector how to best think about uh, biodiversity and the impact, uh, you know, actions uh, uh, around air quality, water quality, coastal protection, and so forth have on the, uh, the ecosystem. So uh, maybe that, that could be another source of uh, research uh, and inspiration for others. Okay, good. Just, uh, just, just, sorry, so just throwing an idea, Patricia, just to say that one needs to distinguish probably between the principles, uh, which are standards, you know, does the project actually uh, uh, respect this or that uh, international soft laws, etc. Distinguish that from the actual measurable metrics, which might be project specific and indeed be operative, more like KPIs uh, relevant to a project. So perhaps the way forward is to try and see how all these different standards can in effect merge into a common set of principles, but at the same time continue to use uh, project specific KPIs uh, for, uh, for investors to feel uh, that they are actually tying in their investment with uh, performance uh, that is measurable on their project. Super. Uh, so we're, I think now uh, at time, we had planned to move to closing remarks uh, at this time. So let me just uh, thank all of you for that uh, great discussion. And, and thanks especially to the panelists for your great comments uh, for our proponents that I think have uh, uh, left them with, uh, I hope, uh, 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 lots to think about and, and enrich their work. So now I want to turn to Manish Bhavna, my colleague uh, who is, has worked very closely with me on the uh, Global Commission Nature-Based Solutions uh, Action Track. Uh, Manish Bhavna is with WRI. So Manish, over to you. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, this has been uh, an incredibly inspiring uh, couple of hours. Uh, it, it reminds me, I, I was having breakfast with my daughter this morning, she's, she's 13, and uh, she, she keeps on asking me continuously about wanting to go skydiving. And this morning she told me eight years ago on this day, there was a guy named Felix Baumgartner that apparently jumped out of a plane from the stratosphere, 24 miles above, uh, above the surface. Uh, and, and, and as more arguments why she should do it. I don't know why she thought that argument would be effective. But the reason I raise this is I, I, going into this conversation, I think there's always kind of a sense we're leaping into, um, into something kind of that's unknown, that there isn't much examples of kind of experience in this area. And I felt today these five models and the conversations uh, and the comments that we heard from both Jay and Radha were really, you know, we're not leaping into the unknown that there are indeed some really good uh, models, examples that we can build from. And so that was, that was incredibly exciting to hear. Um, one of the things that I wanted just to kind of share 
is in the work that we've done with the Global Commission on Adaptation, we, we, we talk about the need for much greater urgency and scale around adaptation, that this is a concept that many people talk about, but we're not seeing the response that we need to see. And we talk about it that in order to get the urgency and scale, we need to see three types of revolutions. We need to see revolutions in knowledge, we need to see revolutions in policies or planning, and we need to see revolutions in finance. And I think to some extent, all three of those revolutions came out quite crisply in today's conversation around knowledge. You take a look at the survey that we had at the outset, um, the data and tools to understand benefits, the awareness on the range of benefits, both of those items on the survey, about 28% were cited as the most important barriers to scale up NBS for adaptation. And you saw some great, um, some great responses to that in the examples. The aquafundo, the hydrological monitoring that is doing a really good um, effort to try to calculate the actual impacts between planting trees and water availability. That innovation around hydrological monitoring is needed in order to better monetize, to better quantify and monetize those benefits. The Yapu example around the data platforms and being able to use more consistent metrics to enable scale. Another good example of how we can actually respond to this knowledge barrier. And then, and then Jay's kind of provocative question that he prompted around, you know, can we try to think about a single metric around resilience or, or, or to be able to enable us to quantify and talk about it in more consistent ways, again, as a way to address the knowledge barrier. So really useful. You know, the second revolution we speak about is around kind of policies and planning. And here, you know, Juan Carlos, uh, Carlos Rodriguez, sorry, Carlos Rodriguez um, earlier today spoke about the innovations that Costa Rica has done with the carbon tax or payment for ecosystem services. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, the tax deduction incentive that the Aquafundo model was also another very good example of that. So how do we get policies that are better able to price the externalities and provide the financial incentive to enable the right decisions to be made? Hugely important. And in this context, it is not only national governments, but a number of people also spoke about subnational entities that are critical to moving this kind of policy framework, these incentives forward, whether it's at the municipal level or even what uh, Philippe mentioned around the coastal management zone kind of entity in Cancun that Swiss Re is engaging with. So looking at subnational entities is an important part of advancing this policy making process. And then, and then this third revolution was really around financing and financial models. 20% of people responded to the survey uh, at the outset spoke about this being the principal barrier. And this is where you know, the landscape resilience fund around you know, this concept of soft loans and working with SMEs, the parametric index instruments that Swiss Re is looking about, the blue bonds and the impact credit kind of innovation that was also spoke about in the context of the Seychelles. So just again, these, these, these um, ideas that are kind of ways in which to tweak the financial model to better take into account the particular characteristics of nature-based solutions as a way to really mobilize, mobilize money. So thinking about all of this around, around knowledge, around policy and planning, and around finance. Just want to close with three very quick points. Um, adaptation, we shouldn't be looking at nature-based solutions solely through a resilience metric or a mitigation metric or a development metric. At the end of the day, they all come together kind of on the ground. And one of the, one of the big conversations looking forward that people are talking about is how to also mobilize kind of private finance for nature, natural climate solution offsets. So there's quite a bit of energy around the mitigation space. I think there's an opportunity there for to us to connect the resilience agenda to that conversation in a more deliberate way. Public support, the second point, public support will remain critical in certain vulnerable communities um, for certain areas where benefits cannot be easily monetized. 
how do we connect that both with COVID recovery plans as well as with the process in the coming year around updating and enhancing NDCs, right? So there's gonna be a big effort in the coming year where countries are gonna talk about updating their NDCs. Nature-based solutions have not been nearly as prevalent in the NDCs in the first generation. Can we prompt, can we, can we push that forward more in the coming year? Does that enable more public support to be then blended with private capital to scale this up? Final point, the coming year is critical. We have the Climate Adaptation Summit in January. We have the Convention on Biological Diversity in China. We have COP26 in Glasgow. The year will be very, very focused with nature-based solutions and how we scale finance for nature-based solutions across all three of these events. So the timing of this conversation and how we keep that moving forward in these political moments in the coming year uh, could not be more opportune. So really exciting to have this conversation before this important year of 2021. Patricia, great to be a partner with you. Uh, Canada, uh, the Jeff, the Global Commission on Adaptation, our friends at the Global Center on Adaptation. Uh, so thank you all, delighted to be here. Back to you. Thank you very much, Manish, for those great closing remarks. Thank you to the, the Global Center, to WRI, who've done so much of the work to put this event together. Uh, thanks once again to our, our, our great model proponents and to our, our two wonderful panelists. Uh, we will, as I noted, uh, have uh, uh, copies of the all of the, the models that we received uh, available uh, on uh, the GCA website. So perhaps we can send out a link uh, to all of the uh, attendees when that uh, is ready. And we encourage you to stay in touch with us as we continue this work towards the, the January 25th uh, uh, Climate Adaptation Summit, where we will be highlighting the, the findings of our action track. So thank you very much to all of you who participated today and have a good day. Thank you, bye. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Gracias, Patricia. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.